Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio this afternoon is Deputy uh, First Minister Responsibilities, Economy and Gaelic. As ever, I would appreciate succinct questions and answers to match. Question number one was not lodged. I call question number two, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its green industrial strategy will encourage companies to remain in Scotland. Deputy First Minister Kate Forbes. Well, the green industrial strategy creates certainty for businesses by spelling out where, where, where we believe the greatest opportunities lie and where we'll focus our attention and resources. In doing so, it provides clear direction, clear focus to create confidence and encourage investment. And we'll use all the powers at our disposal to make Scotland a fantastic place to invest in these green economic opportunities. And the strategy contains a range of specific actions, including hosting a global offshore wind investment forum next spring and working with the sector to develop hubs to address hydrogen production and demand. Dr. Thompson. Uh, this morning, the Scottish Government's own task force for green and sustainable financial services published their first report. In it, they identify a worrying trend of top jobs in finance drifting south. So would the Deputy First Minister that accept that if Scotland is to realise the economic benefits of the transition to net zero, the SNP Government need to abandon the damaging tax gap that it has created with the rest of the UK, a gap that is driving away investment and putting Scotland at a competitive disadvantage? Deputy First Minister. Well, I'm absolutely delighted that Douglas Lumsden has read the uh, recommendations of the Task Force on Green and Sustainable uh, Finance. I am extremely uh, proud uh, and of, of the report that was drafted by a, an independent group chaired by David Pitt Watson. It's a brilliant piece of work and it outlines how Scotland can build on our strengths as a, a finance centre eh, and marry that with the huge economic opportunities eh, when it comes to green industries. And it makes quite clear that the prize is big. We start with uh, very strong uh, foundations. It will build on that. Uh, and on the specific question, I would just refer him to the HMRC figures, again, independently done on the impact, the behavioural impact of the tax changes. Supplementary, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, oil, gas and energy companies operating in the North East have said they are slowing down investment as a result of UK government policies, uh, with Unite the Union warning that Labour's plans could put 30,000 jobs over a cliff edge by 2030. Given that uh, investment in our renewables future is dependent on those workers, can the Deputy First Minister say any more about what the Scottish Government can do to protect and build investor confidence in Scotland's energy industry? Deputy First Minister. Well, Kevin Stewart is absolutely right to highlight the importance of giving uh, investors confidence, the sector confidence, in order to protect the job. And, you know, in terms of uh, Unite the Union's warnings, uh, I cannot disagree at all. And I sincerely hope uh, that Labour will heed uh, those warnings. Uh, in terms of uh, the fiscal regime for North Sea oil and gas, that's reserved to the UK Government. We've been very clear about the importance of uh, effective and substantive investment allowances for activity in the North Sea so that they can reinvest in decarbonisation as part of a just transition to net zero. In terms of supporting the workers, the Green Industrial Strategy highlights the opportunities where we want to see growth, more employment and give a future to those workers. And supplementary, Billy Rennie. The Deputy First Minister knows that I am concerned about Liberty Steel's DL plant. It is important for the Green Industrial Strategy, particularly onshore wind. So can she provide the Chamber with an update on the plant? Deputy First Minister. Well, Willie Rennie has raised this with me uh, in the past. Uh, we have constant engagement uh, on, uh, on, on the DL uh, plant. Um, uh, there, there's nothing currently uh, to report uh, in terms of matters of importance. Uh, I'm very happy to have a separate conversation with Willie Rennie if there are uh, substantive issues that he wants to draw to my attention, and I can ensure that uh, we get a reply to him. But in my ongoing engagement on the matter, uh, there's nothing to update the, the Chamber on. Question number three, Claire Hockey. To ask the Scottish Government, as part of the development and delivery of its economic strategy, what assessment it is made of the contribution of the drink sector to the economy? Minister Richard Lockhead. 
The drink sector is vital to Scotland's economy, generating turnover of £6.3 billion per annum and directly employing around 13,000 people and, of course, supporting thousands of more jobs throughout the wider supply chain. And as a government, we will continue to support the sector with the huge role it plays in contributing towards our priority to grow Scotland's economy. But we also welcome the sector's willingness to innovate, particularly good work it's doing around cutting emissions from production to help tackle the climate emergency. Claire Hockey. I thank the Minister for that answer. I recently visited the Tenants Facility in Cambus Lang in my constituency and I was delighted to learn of their plans to upgrade this distribution centre, ensuring jobs and careers on site for many years to come. Local production and sourcing of products supports thousands more jobs across the country and international exports also help to boost the Scottish economy. Would the Minister consider meeting this staple Scottish brand to explore further how they can continue to support and grow the Scottish economy? Minister. I thank Clear Hockey for bringing that important investment to the Chamber's attention. It's a good news story. Clearly very good news for the campus Lang area in particular, as well as the country as a whole in the drink sector. Uh, personally, as Business Minister, I would be more than happy to meet the company if she wishes to help arrange that. Uh, and I, I know I speak to my colleagues in terms of their willingness to meet the company, if that is more appropriate uh, as well. Uh, there are a number of good news stories in the drink sector in Scotland, and it is good to hear of the investment in tenants facility in Cambus Lang. And supplementary, Murdy Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I remind the member, uh, not remind the member, remind the Chamber of my register of interest in relation to hospitality I have received from the Scotch Whisky Association? Um, can I ask the Minister, he will recall that the Scottish Government previously consulted on draconian rules to restrict alcohol marketing, which caused a great deal of alarm amongst the drink sector. We have not had an update recently from the Scottish Government on where matters stand in relation to that. Can he tell us now? Minister. Well, I think there has been a number of comments made about that, and the Scottish Government is about to commission Public Health Scotland to carry out a review of the evidence on a range of options that are available for the Scottish Government under devolved powers. And of course, once that's decided, there will be further consultation. So I'm sure Parliament will be kept up to date. I'm sure that's the case, and it has been up to, up to now. Uh, and it's interesting the member mentions the Scotch Whisky Association because one of the biggest concerns they have expressed to myself and indeed to the Government as a whole is the rate of tax applied by the UK Government under his own party's administration over many, many years. And I noticed the text, uh, sorry, the, the tweet from the last 24 hours by the Scotch Whisky Association. It says, Spirits like Scotch whisky sold in the UK are subject to the highest rate of taxation in the G7 and double the average across Europe. Double France, five times Japan and three times Italy. That is a big, big issue for the Scotch whisky industry if he wishes to take that on board. Question number four, Jimmy Green. Thank you, Mr. Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what improvements it has considered making to the governance arrangements at Ferguson Marine in light of recent reported concerns around quality control at the Yard. Deputy First Minister. Well, the Strategic Commercial Assets Division is responsible for governance arrangements around the delivery of Glen Sanox and Glen Rosa. That includes weekly meetings with the management team at Ferguson Marine and recently, recently introduced daily reports from the technical advisers that enable us to closely monitor progress with a handover of Glen Sanox. The implementation of quality control measures is an operational matter for Ferguson Marine in line with the framework agreement, which was refreshed this year to take account of the need for operational independence. Jamie Green. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister? Can I cast the Deputy First Minister's memory back to the end of June, that glorious summer day, when I stood at the front of this chamber and asked her if she was expecting any delays to the delivery of the Glen Sanox? Would it be delivered, for example, by the end of July, as was promised? I was reassured twice, if not three times, in response to that, that there were no delays. Two days later, and funny enough, as we'd all exited the building for the summer recess, guess what? Delays were announced. And spoiler, spoiler alert to other colleagues, the ship has still yet to be handed over to Calmac, and it's nearly October. So can I ask, given that this is supposedly a strategic national asset to the country, how, what faith can we have that the Scottish Government, who sits as a director of that company, has any oversight or responsibility in these decisions and including any delays which we usually discover via the media instead of through in this chamber. Deputy First Minister. Well, um, the, in light of the operational independence of the Yard, the member will know that I uh, don't control and I don't dictate 
when the Chief Executive and the Chair choose to update Parliament because they are directly accountable to Parliament as well. So in terms of the timing of that letter, uh, there was no uh, involvement from myself uh, in terms of the, the timing of that letter. And at the point at when I answered the member, I was answering on the basis of all the evidence I had before me at that point. And I think it is really important to put that on the record. Um, in terms of uh, the most recent letter to the uh, Net Zero uh, Committee on the 12th of September, again, uh, a letter that was issued by uh, the Chair um, at his decision, the interim chief executive of Ferguson Marine indicated that the handover date for Glen Sanex would move to mid-October 2024, and the proposed handover for Glen Rosa remains at 30th September 2025 on the basis of the, all the evidence I have in front of me. A supplementary, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Deputy First Minister say any more about how the Scottish Government is working on the next phase of the modernisation of the site to ensure that the site actually has a sustainable and also competitive future? Deputy First Minister. Well, that is our aim and ambition, a sustainable and competitive future for, for, the, for the yard, and we are fully committed uh, to delivering that beyond the completion of Glen Sanox and Glen Rosa. When I visited the yard in July, I signalled the government's willingness to back the board's investment plan, provided it delivers value for money and meets commercial standards. And as work on the Kyle Muck ferries continue, our priority is helping Ferguson Marine secure and win commercial contracts positioning it to thrive in a competitive market, learning from successful international models and strengthening the yard's competitiveness through investment. Question number five, Maggie Chapman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the findings of the Fair Work Convention's inquiry into fair work in the hospitality industry. Minister Tom Arthur. Presiding officer, I was pleased to attend the publication launch of the independent inquiry into the hospitality industry yesterday. We welcome the report and recommendations, which are the culmination of extensive consultation, research and dialogue with employers, employees, trade union representatives and key industry trade bodies, and include recommendations intended to support both workers and employers to improve pay, working conditions and inclusion in the sector. I would like to thank the Fair Work Convention for conducting this important inquiry. The Scottish Government will carefully consider its recommendations and set out a response in due course. Maggie Chapman. I thank the Minister for his response. The inquiry recommends the establishment of a voluntary fair work charter for hospitality that stipulates a range of workers' protections, from payment of the real living wage and recognition of real living hours, to effective voice, robust anti-bullying procedures and safe home policies for all workers asked to travel or work after 11pm. Can the Minister say how quickly he expects the charter to be in place, what mechanisms could be in place if an employer breaches any aspects of the Charter, and how he expects public bodies, including local authorities, to support the implementation of the Charter? And will the Scottish Government incentivise the adoption of the Charter through conditionality of, pub of public funding? Minister. Well, can I thank the member for her supplementary and also recognise her long-standing interest in this area as well. And I know that she also attended the launch yesterday. As I said in my original answer, given that uh, this is a very substantial and detailed piece of work, which a tremendous amount of effort has been into from a range of stakeholders, I want to ensure that the government's consideration of it is commensurate to that. Clearly, the member will be aware and appreciate the range of activities that the Scottish Government has undertaken to promote fair work within the limitations of devolved competency. And I think that signifies the huge importance that this Government places upon fair work. And as such, we will engage in that spirit with the recommendations of the report and will update Parliament accordingly. And supplementary, Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While employment law remains reserved to Westminster, it is vital that the Scottish Government does all it can to incentivise and promote fair work. Can the Minister say any more about how the Scottish Government is working to drive fair work practices across the private sector? And will he join me in continuing to call for employment law to be devolved to this Parliament so that we can ensure that workers are treated fairly and paid fairly in Scotland? Minister. I can thank the member for the question and I would echo that call for the devolution of employment law to this parliament. We use a, a range of methods through our leadership on fair work principles, our support of the Fair Work Convention and detailed considerations of its reports. 
and we also seek through uh, conditionality as well in the use of public finances to incentivise the uptake of practices that are consistent with fair work, such as the real living wage and effective employee voice. We, will, uh, we very much welcome the agenda that the new UK Government has set out with regards to making work pay. Scottish Ministers are committed to engaging closely on that. But I would um, echo the point that um, one certainty in, in uh, British politics is that Labour governments are followed by Conservative governments who invariably have an alternative set of priorities when it comes to fair work. And as such, we have seen rolling back of fair work principles and the rights of trade unions under Conservative administrations. So to ensure that we can progress fair work and we can ensure that it is embedded and permanent in Scotland, we require the devolution of employment rights to this Parliament. And supplementary, Brian Hussle. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The transportation portfolio is mentioned numerous times in the Fair Work Convention inquiry into fair work in the hospitality industry. Does the Minister agree with me that reintroduction of peak fares on ScotRail further increases inequality for workers within hospitality, particularly in rural areas where employees find it more expensive to commute to work, given that Scotland is now the most, has now the most expensive train fares in Europe? Minister. The report... Um, the inquiry makes um, a, a range of recommendations which we will give detailed consideration to. Uh, matters pertaining to uh, peak fares have been set out in some detail uh, by my ministerial colleagues to this chamber. That is ultimately a consequence of the uh, significantly challenging position we face with the public finances, caused in no small part by Mr Whittle's party. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Lumsden. Uh, may I continue? Question number six, not lodged. Question number seven, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will set out how it measures economic growth, including what metrics it uses to assess success in economic growth. Minister Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government publishes monthly and quarterly GDP for Onshore Scotland. This is the headline measure for Scottish economic growth. The National Performance Framework also has indicators, and that some of these show whether growth is improving or worsening. However, following the unprecedented disruption to GDP during the COVID pandemic, recent trends are distorted and performance cannot meaningfully be compared to previous years. As such, that particular indicator uh, was not reported for 2023. But growing the economy is one of our four programme for government priorities, and since 2007, Scotland's GDP per person has grown by 10.7%, compared to only 5.6% in the UK as a whole. Liam Kerr. Well, one measure of growth might be to ask what size the Scottish budget is, and what it would have been had the Scottish Government made the same policy choices as the UK Government. Now, the Scottish Fiscal Commission did just that pointing out that the SNP's policy choices have cost the Scottish budget £624 million, something the Cabinet Secretary for Finance failed to mention in her recent statement. Does the Minister think that Graeme Roy or Shona Robeson's analysis is correct, and does he accept the SNP's drastic spending cuts are the result of policy choices by the SNP? Minister. This is Scottish devolution. We take decisions in line with the priorities in Scotland. We don't replicate UK policies and UK choices. But can I just point out to the member that today's headline from Ian McConnell from the Herald newspaper just published in the last few hours is entitled Scottish economy grows as UK stagnates. New data reveals. That's the latest monthly figures for GDP. So the Scottish economy is faring well under many indicators against what is quite a difficult backdrop, much of which has been caused by UK government policy. If you look at the Business Insight Survey, for instance, in terms of the optimism or otherwise of the business community, their highest concerns are inflation, energy prices, and so on, and then we've got the cost of Brexit to add to that. They are UK policy choices that we would have not chosen in Scotland, and that's why it's important we do what's best for Scotland. And according to the existing many different in indicators for economic growth, Scotland's performing relatively well compared to the rest of the UK. Supplementary, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. UK government debt has risen to its highest level since the 1960s. The UK Chancellor announced £22 billion worth of cuts, and economists warned last week that the impact of Brexit is worsening. Can the Minister advise how we in Scotland can grow our economy in such a challenging UK environment, leaving Scotland tied to a failing economy? Minister. 
Well, clearly our programme for government sets out the steps we are taking to grow our economy, creating jobs and supporting innovation through, for instance, the Scottish National Investment Bank, as well as attracting investment in net zero housing and infrastructure. And our economy is performing relatively well, as I just indicated in my previous answer to, to the, uh, the members, with earnings, for instance, last year growing faster than any other part of the UK as well. But there is, of course, a limit to the actions we can take, while many of the key powers and tax and the economy do remain reserved to Westminster. And that's why, of course, we want further powers for this Parliament and independence, which would give us the powers to build a greener, fairer and wealthier Scotland. And some of the sectors in Scotland that are performing particularly well just now, behind the GDP figures I mentioned, like information and communications, are really national strengths we have in this country to build economic growth in the future. And that's why we're focusing on many of these strong sectors. And supplementary, Daniel Johnson. It's really vital that we close the £600 million performance gap, but it doesn't help if you cherry-pick economic data. So the government is right that since 2007, performance in GDP per head was 11% versus 6 But since 2016, the point of income tax devolution, Scottish economic growth GDP per head was 2.6% versus 44 In Manchester, since 2007, GDP per head grew by 21.4%. Yeah. Likewise, if you look at inward investment data, while they are right to point the EY uh, data, ONS data shows that the number, the by value and jobs created, Scotland's lagging both the West Midlands and North West. In terms of jobs created, we have under half the number of jobs created by inward investment. So does the Minister agree with me? If we're going to tackle the gap, we need a broader set of measures. And most importantly, and I'd be interested in this, does he think that we need to have a better view in terms of how Scotland's comparing to the other nations and regions of the United Kingdom? Minister. I thought it was intriguing how the member mentioned 2016 because there was an event in 2016, of course, that had a very, very detrimental impact on Scotland's economy called Brexit. And all the evidence, all the evidence shows that there was a disproportionate impact of Brexit on the Scottish economy compared to the rest of the UK, given our exports to the EU and other factors as well. The, the member is shaking his head in frustration. Brexit has had an enormous impact on the Scottish economy, and his party have stuck to the Tory policy of supporting Brexit, compounding the damage to the Scottish economy. Indeed, there was a report just out from a university in the last week showing that small businesses in particular have been hit hard with their exports being curtailed due to Brexit. So, yes, we should always keep these measures under review. I accept that, and it's an important point. There's, I think we can agree with that. But let's live in the real world and not turn a blind eye to the impact of Brexit and other factors, notwithstanding also budget cuts in Westminster have had in the Scottish economy. Question number eight, Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to boost the confidence in the retail sector. Minister Tom Arthur. The Scottish Government deeply values the vital role retail businesses play in the growth of Scotland's economy. We will continue to build on the foundations we have already created jointly with business representatives and remain fully committed to the New Deal for business. In terms of sectoral support, we are maintaining the Small Business Bonus Scheme, the most generous of its kind in the UK, which offers up to 100 per cent relief from non-domestic rates. A retail strategy sets out how we will work with businesses and trade unions to deliver a strong and prosperous retail sector. Annie Wells. I thank the Minister for that answer. Data from the Scottish Retail Consortium and KPMG showed that total sales in Scotland decreased by 0.5% in August of this year, compared to August last year. And considering that our high streets are already struggling, thanks to the SNP's failure to pass on rates relief last year, does the Minister accept that more needs to be done to help this sector deliver the economic growth Scotland needs? Minister. Well, look, it's, it's always important when considering um, data to recognise that there can be a, a wide range of factors that impact upon um, what data ultimately uh, materialises at the end of a month. And the member will be aware of some of the uh, meteorological conditions that impacted upon the high street over the summer, if we can even call it a summer. Look, the, 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 I've, I've had this you know, um, exchange with a member previously in the chamber. The challenges that the retail sector face are significant and are structural, and they are not unique to Scotland. They are a combination of factors over many years. I give for example, when this, when this party came to power in 2007, from memory, retail sales accounted online accounted for about 2 per cent of retail sales. It peaked at over, I think, 30 per cent in the pandemic, and it's still in the 20s now, a 20 per cent figure now. We have the uh, vast significant growth um, of out-of-town retail 
um, in the 1980s and the 1990s as well. A range of different factors which are having a direct impact upon the high street today. There is important work taking place, but it is not going to be an overnight fix. And while the regulatory and fiscal environment is of significant importance, there is a broader range of factors. And key to that, of course, will be regeneration, investment in our town and city centres, and of particular importance, increasing um, re the residential population of our town and city centres. That is going to be of significant importance in the future of the high street and as such for the future of the retail sector. And supplementary, Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Retail Economics and Trade Bite have reported that British brands and retailers have seen international sales to the EU plummet by nearly £6 billion since Brexit. Can the Minister provide any update on what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the continued cost of Brexit to business? Minister. President Officer, business surveys show that of all Scottish businesses trading with the EU, 48 per cent of exporters and 58 per cent of importers face increased costs due to Brexit. Brexit has been estimated to have left the UK economy at least £69 billion worse off compared with EU membership. The Scottish Government continues to favour, of course, Scotland rejoining the European Union single market as an independent country. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on Deputy First Minister Responsibilities, Economy and Gallic. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next portfolio to allow front bench teams to change position, should they wish. Thank you. Thank you. The next portfolio this afternoon is finance and local government. Again, succinct questions and answers always appreciated. And at question number one, I call Ariane Burgess. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the commitment in its 2024 to 2025 programme for government to consult on modernisation of the compulsory purchase system to help deliver a wide range of projects in the public interest, whether this consultation will include compulsory sales orders and compulsory rental orders in its scope. Minister Ivan McKee. Compulsory purchase orders can be effective in supporting the delivery of much needed development in the public interest. However, the legislation is recognised as being complex and out of date. We believe its reform could contribute to outcomes people associate with compulsory sales orders, for example, bringing more vacant property back into use. That is why, as a first step, we have established an advisory group to help review the current legislation and its operation, seeking ways of improving it and making it easier to use. We also continue to consider the justification for and practical operation of compulsory sales orders. I thank the Minister for that answer. Compulsory sales orders and rental orders are critical to tackle the blight of abandoned buildings and derelict land and transform them to build community wealth, particularly while local government finances are so restricted. Is the government able to confirm that the review will also look at enabling both the public sector and communities to capture uplifts in land value resulting from development, for example, through disregarding hope value? Minister. Uh, the, um, I know that there is work going on on, um, on land reform, but on the specific issue that she asks, that the work that has been done on compulsory um, purchase orders is to update the, um, uh, the legislation to enable that process to be smoother and able to be applied more effectively. Clearly, the value uh, that is ascribed when a compulsory purchase order goes through has to take into account a number of factors relating to the value of uh, the asset that has been purchased at that point in time. Is that for mentioning Mark Griffin? Thank you, President Officer. A compulsory sale order could be a really valuable tool for local authorities to remove the blight of, of empty homes in our communities. I wonder, as well as the review of the uh, community sale purchase orders, whether the government is looking at a, a whole suite of measures to tackle the blight of empty properties, including a council tax multiplier, which could then uh, fund some of the compulsory sale or purchase orders. Yeah. Minister? Uh, I, I, the, already the, uh, the councils have the, the opportunity to um, increase the council tax on, uh, on empty properties, and that is going through um, as, a, as an option for them to take into account. Clearly, the work being done um, by uh, the group 
looking at um, the, the work government is undertaking to look at uh, what can be done to bring more properties back into use, working with stakeholders is ongoing, and we look for all opportunities and levers that we can use in that regard. And that is why the reform of compulsory purchase orders is, is important to make that easier to use um, a, a, and more effective tool for local authorities uh, and other public bodies. And as I said, we're also looking at the scope uh, and, and the value that compulsory sale orders could bring to that picture. But it's not a panacea. Here, there are many complexities round about the application of compulsory sales orders that need to be considered as well as part of this review. Question number two, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has undertaken of, the Scot of Scotland's fiscal position would be today if a yes vote had been returned in the independence referendum on the 18th of September 2014. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Uh, thank you. Um, as a, an independent country, Scotland would make its own decisions, including on things like EU membership. Modelling suggests that as a result of Brexit, compared to being in the EU, the UK economy was 2.5 per cent smaller in 2023, representing a cut in Scottish public revenues of around 2.3 billion. And of course, independence would give Scotland full control of the economic levers needed, as outlined in the Building a New Scotland Economic Prospectus for low energy prices, investment of up to £20 billion in major infrastructure and strengthened workplace rights, all of which would boost our economic future and allow Scotland to escape an economic model in the UK, which concentrates wealth in London and the southeast of England, while producing inequality, low investment and low productivity. Stuart McMillan. Thank the Finance Secretary for that reply. And certainly since 2014, Scotland has suffered under the four failed Tory premierships. We have been taken out of the EU against our will, with Brexit wreaking havoc on our economy, as we heard in the earlier session. We have witnessed high inflation, a disastrous economic experiment from Liz Truss, and a cost of living crisis made worse by a Westminster government intent on protecting themselves and their friends instead of the majority of the population. So does the Cabinet Secretary therefore agree with me that independence is the only way that we can ensure we get cheaper energy, bearing in mind the comments, bear in mind the comments from Greg Jackson, the Octavus Energy CEO, with regards to Scotland that could have the cheapest electricity in Europe if the UK implemented regional pricing and market reform? Yep. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, as a country, we are blessed with extraordinary natural and energy resources with a world-leading renewable energy industry. And an independent Scotland would, of course, uh, design the electricity market in line with Scotland's interests. That would allow, for example, a break in the link between the price of electricity and the price of gas, which is a key factor driving the high prices for Scottish households, businesses and industry. And, of course, with full powers, we would uh, seek to pass through the lower cost of renewables to customers, with the price of electricity more accurately reflecting our abundant low-cost uh, renewable resources. Meanwhile, of course, we will continue to push the UK Government to ensure that the electricity market reforms support Scotland's net zero ambitions, as well as our aims to tackle fuel poverty. Supplementary, Murdoch Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government's own GERS figures show that Scotland would have a nominal deficit of £22.7 billion, 10.4% of GDP, a, a number that is truly unsustainable and more than double the rate of the UK as a whole. Instead of giving us fantasy economics, can the Finance Secretary tell us what tax increases would be necessary in order to fill that gap? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, GERS represents Scotland's fiscal position under the current constitutional arrangements, and the figures represent a notional uh, fiscal deficit. Secondly, 90 per cent of the GERS fiscal deficit is due to UK government choices. And thirdly, thirdly equating GERS with Scottish government finances is just plain wrong, given that this government has balanced the budget every year for 17 years and will continue to do so. Question number three, Jackington Barr. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent UK Government announcements ahead of its budget statement, whether it will provide an update on its latest engagement with the UK Government regarding the potential devolution of further financial powers to Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. I have been clear in my initial engagement with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury that Scotland requires further fiscal flexibilities to provide greater funding, certainty and stability for our public services. And I know this is something that my counterparts in the other devolved administrations 
also want to explore with the Treasury. I have recently written to the Chancellor setting out the Scottish Government's priorities ahead of the UK budget, and I intend to raise this issue when I meet with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury next month, along with Welsh and Northern Irish finance ministers. Jackie Tinbar. Under current constitutional arrangements, Westminster austerity continues to harm Scottish folk, as demonstrated by Labour's recent cuts to the winter fuel payment. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the case could not be stronger for full financial powers to lie with this Parliament so that we can deliver the fairer investment that our public services and folk across Scotland deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, of course, Jackie Dunbar is right that it could not be clearer that Scotland would, of course, be best served by a full range of fiscal powers and choices that independence would bring. Meanwhile, of course, I'll work uh, to try and persuade the UK Government to deliver improvements to the current fiscal devolution settlement next week. As I said, I'll be meeting with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and the devolved finance ministers, and I'll set out the need for further fiscal flexibilities to enhance Scotland's financial management powers. And of course, uh, we want to pursue further devolution of tax powers, and I don't believe we are alone uh, in this among the devolved nations. Question number four, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the comments of Professor Graham Roy, Chair of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, that Scotland's net position in 2022-23 was around £624 million lower than it would have been had Scottish economic performance matched that of the rest of the UK. Cabinet Secretary. Previous Scottish Government analysis, as reported in the 2022 MTFS, outlines the historic impact of the downturn in the oil and gas industry and strong growth in earnings and financial services around London and the South East and the associated effect on Scottish income tax revenues due to the operation of the fiscal framework. The SFC acknowledges some more recent economic data is positive, with 22-23 and 23-24 earnings growth in Scotland faster than any other part of the UK. Our programme for government and upcoming tax strategy will build on this, identifying areas which can support economic growth through creating good, well-paid jobs that support our tax base and revenues. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. The SNP Scottish Government has been in power for 17 years and is not a powerless bystander. Your argument has been torpedoed, Cabinet Secretary, by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. The 624 million figure is remarkably similar to the fiscal gap that the Cabinet Secretary is trying to meet at the expense of the people of Scotland and the people of my constituency in the border, borders. Will the Cabinet Secretary admit that ordinary working class people in Scotland are bearing the brunt of the SNP's hapless spending choices? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, Rachel Hamilton forgets one point that this refers to a previous financial year, not this uh, financial year, where the gap is driven largely by the UK pay review body recommendations being accepted, adding £800 million this year into our in-year pressure. So Rachel Hamilton is comparing uh, different years. But let me say this, uh, that it's very positive um, that uh, we are, are seeing um, that uh, the SFC's judgment is that our income tax policies announced for 24-25 are not economy moving, but on the positive side, we are seeing RBS Growth Tracker, for example, reporting Scottish business confidence being at an 18-month high, and we are seeing uh, out the GDP per person, growth in productivity, earnings growth and foreign direct investment um, all outstripping the rest of the UK. So it would be good just occasionally to hear some positive news from the Tory benches about the Scottish economy because there is a lot positive to talk about. And supplementary, Willie Rennie. If the Finance Secretary is taking credit for all the things that she has just listed, does she accept any responsibility for the £624 million gap? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have explained that the, the gap, of course, is linked to the operation of the fiscal framework and the block grant adjustment that looks at earnings growth uh, and, uh, and the comparison at that point was, of course, a downturn in the oil and gas industry in Scotland 
uh, bearing down on revenues and at the same time strong growth in earnings and financial services in London and the South East. And of course, if you know how the fiscal framework operates, then that widened the gap in terms of the £600 million, £634 million gap. That is how the fiscal framework operates. What I'm saying, though, is that the SFC acknowledges more recent economic data showing strong earnings growth in Scotland being faster than any other part of the UK, and that consequently means additional revenues for the Scottish budget. That's how the fiscal framework works. Question number five, Colette Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what estimate it has made of the cost of private finance initiative repayments in the current financial year. Minister. The latest published data shows that the total estimated cost of private finance initiative PFI payments in 2024-25 is £1.1 billion. Colette Stevenson. I thank the Minister for that response. PFI, a Tory creation, was enthusiastically rolled out by previous Labour governments. And now in 2024, history is repeating itself with Labour keeping cruel Tory policies like the two-child cap and bedroom tax. Mm -hmm. From toxic PFI debt to protecting people from the worst of Westminster austerity, can the Minister confirm how much the SNP Scottish Government is spending to pay off the poor choices of Labour and the Conservatives? Uh, thank you. Uh, and I would say, Minister, dealing with the question at hand, which is the cost of PFI. Uh, yeah, there are currently 74 ongoing PFI contracts and the total estimated cost of all the remaining payment charges from 24-25 onwards is approximately £13.6 billion. Uh, and the Scottish Government has called on the UK Government to reverse the damaging policies of the previous administration, including the removal of the benefit cap and abolishing the bedroom tax and the two-child limit. We are spending £134 million this year alone mitigating damaging welfare policies put in place by the previous UK Government, including the benefit cap and the bedroom tax. This is money that could have been spent on services like health and education or on further ambitious anti poverty measures and would pay for around 2,000 teachers or ban five nurses each year. Question number six, Colin Beattie. We need Mr. Please start again. Colin Beattie. Yeah. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Midlothian and East Lothian councils regarding the financial impact of national policies in light of reports of their constrained budgets. Cabinet Secretary. Following discussions with East and Mid Lothian, I used the limited discretion available to ministers to adjust the local government distribution funding floor for this year's budget. This ensures funding allocations more accurately reflect the latest population census data, directly benefiting both councils. Discussions with uh, both councils continue alongside those with all authorities and COSLA. Colin <coughs> Uh, thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Midlothian and East Lothian are some of the fastest growing areas in Scotland. In light of these population changes, how is the Scottish Government ensuring that national policies are equitably funded across all local authorities? Cabinet Secretary. Um, as I referenced in my uh, original answer, the needs-based distribution formula is uh, kept under constant review and uses uh, the most up-to-date data available, including the new census data. As uh, Midlothian and East Lothian council areas have growing populations, then they will receive uh, an increased share of the available funding all other factors uh, being equal. Of course, any change to the distribution formula more widely would require the agreement uh, of COSLA and the 32 local authorities. Question number seven, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government, in relation to the local government funding settlement, what discussions the Finance Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues regarding the potential revenue that local authorities could generate through de decriminalised parking enforcement regimes in their areas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, whilst ministers routinely discuss revenue raising opportunities with local authorities and amongst one another, they, amongst one another uh, there have been no specific discussions on decriminalised uh, parking enforcement. 
Decriminalised parking enforcement is a regime that local authorities may choose to apply for, depending on the requirement for parking enforcement in their area. Currently, 22 of the 32 local authorities in Scotland operate this regime. It should always be viewed as a form of enforcement, though, rather than a source of income. Emma Harper. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Dumfries and Galloway Council is currently in the process of applying for decriminalised parking enforcement with the application currently sitting with Transport Scotland. Given the revenue generated by many other local authorities, and I agree it should be about enforcement, not revenue, can the Minister give an indication of the timescales for Transport Scotland to provide a decision on the application process? And does she agree with me that decriminalised parking enforcement also has the ability to better address illegal parking and make our communities more accessible for those with disabilities? Cabinet Secretary. Officials in Transport Scotland have been in ongoing discussion with Dumfries and Galloway uh, regarding de decriminalised parking enforcement. However, uh, they are yet to receive a completed application. Once received, it can take in the region of 12 months to bring DPE powers into force due to the time taken to draft, consult and lay the necessary SSIs. Local authorities are best placed to determine whether taking on DPE powers is the best way to address illegal parking in their area, but I would encourage those without DPE to consider investigating whether it would be beneficial. And question number eight, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government whether its plans to reassess its tax policies in light of reports from some businesses that higher taxes are having a negative impact on recruitment, including in the most recent Fraser of Allender Institute survey on Scottish income tax. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Well, of course, tax policy for 2025-26 will be announced as part of the Scottish Budget, and we continue to closely monitor the impact of our tax policy on the wider economy. Since the introduction of Scottish income tax in 2017-18, more taxpayers have come to Scotland than have left, with net inflows averaging almost 4,200 per year. In 2021-22, the latest available year of data, net migration of taxpayers was positive across all tax bands, with taxable income increasing by 200 million as a result. Finley Carson. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Uh, highly skilled workers are essential to building the kind of high growth economy that Scotland deserves. Many firms admit they are struggling to attract and retain talent. Does the, the Cabinet Secretary agree that the greater income tax burden being placed on higher earners in Scotland has led to warnings from various quarters that some taxpayers are considering moving away? Mm -hmm. Indeed, the Deputy First Minister Kate Forbes has recently admitted the situation is being kept under review and acknowledges how easy it is for taxpayers to shift. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, as I said in my original answer, the data, the data shows that the net migration of taxpayers across all tax bands was positive coming to Scotland, increasing income by 200 million as a result. And of course, um, the RTI pay as you earn tax data for 2023-24 suggested that growth in Scottish PAYE income tax receipts outperformed the rest of the UK, with tax receipts per head growing the fastest since yep. data has been available. On top of that, as I mentioned earlier on, the RBS growth tracker reported Scottish business confidence at an 18-month high. Now, I know these are figures and facts that the Scottish Tories don't like to hear because they don't seem to ever want to hear or say anything positive about the Scottish economy. I think that does the Scottish economy, our businesses and our hard-working workforce a great disservice. And supplementary, Claire Hockey. This SNP Scottish Government's decisions on income tax since the devolution of powers are estimated to have raised around £1.5 billion more in 2024 25 compared with if we had UK rates and bans. That's vital funding that can be used to support our public services and deliver the Scottish Child Payment. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns about the impact it would have on our ability to support our public services and tackle child poverty? if we were to follow the Tories' ill-judged plans for tax cuts. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the simple fact is that if the Tories, or, or Labour for that matter, want the rates and bans of the UK government to be matched, then they need to set out where the £1.5 billion of cuts in current spending would 
fall. Modelling published in February estimates that this government's policies will keep 100,000 children out of relative poverty in 2024-25 policies like the Scottish Child Payment that are possible because of our progressive income tax model. So it is incumbent on opposition parties calling for lower taxes and at the same time higher spending, of course, to explain how slashing social security spending and investment in public services will make Scotland a better place. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on finance and local government. There will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change position should they so wish. Thank you.